Here we go. Welcome, welcome. Good morning, Brand Innovators. Uh, yeah. Uh, we are very excited to be with you today, and I feel like it's perfect branding for BI in the industry, too, because it's serendipitous with your favorite words. This Pad Squad partnership, actually, the genesis came from a Brand Innovators dinner. So, very cool uh, to enter year two working with these guys. And, uh, Kim, I would love to kind of get a little intro for the group here on your experience, because I feel like it's so uh, so applicable and so relevant to everything you do, the fact that you've been able to have a whole career on the agency side before coming over to ESPN. So please tell us a little bit about how, how you started, how you got here, and what we're doing today over at ESPN. Thank you, Gary. So I'm Kim Quilo. Um Was introduced as Kim, love that, to be on par with Cher and Madonna. Let's keep that going. Um, but yes, I started my career on the agency side at a small independent firm in San Monica called RPA, working on automotive. So super long, planning lead times, um, and then had the privilege to work at OMD on Visa, moving the business from the West Coast to the East Coast, and that's where I really dipped my toes into the sports sponsorship side of things. They had um, a really great relationship with the Olympics and the NFL at the time, and that's where I really built up my experience in understanding the science of media strategy and planning, and that every impression is put out intentionally with a lot of thought and a lot of statistics, which I didn't think was ever going to come back and haunt me after I graduated from college. So anytime I was like, when am I ever going to use this in real life? It's like, case in point. Um, with that being said, great experience with the agency side, but had a huge yearning to be part of something bigger. And the question I kept asking myself year in and year out was, well, we're getting the same brief, but did we accomplish the goal? What is the long-term strategy? Did we drive business result? And that's what really inspired me to apply to ESPN. I actually met a gentleman on the train here where he's like, who did you know to get into ESPN? And I was like, I literally applied on the website and was plucked out and have had the privilege for over almost nine years. So really excited and to have grown up really here at ESPN. So fitting the path with digital. Yes. Um, and then, oh, wonderful. Uh, how? What? What's your role now currently at ESPN? Obviously, we see it up here. There's a whole lot of words and words that everyone is, uses on a daily basis. But um, what are some of the things that your team's responsible for, and how are you guys kind of looking at week over week, month over month, quarter over quarter, new responsibilities? Thank you. So started out and planning college football. So worked as kind of the internal media agency and expert at that time. And the fun fact is that um, my collegiate college football team, collegiate plus double, duplicative, sorry, early. Um, what team? LMU. LMU does not have a football team. So I went in, dove into the deep end, and I remember sitting my first college football meeting, and they were like, OK, so we're going to promote Alabama and Wisconsin. I grew up in California, and I was like, who cares about Alabama and Wisconsin? <laughs> Apparently, everybody, everybody cares about Alabama and Wisconsin. Roll Tide. Roll Tide. No. War Eagle. War Eagle. OK, so um, started out in college football, really driving, kind of working with our media team, managing the agency, really partnering them. Not managing them. We were true partners. I, I see our media agency as an extension of our team. And um, then went on to the full portfolio. So the fun, the fun question at every Christmas dinner was, oh, what sport do you work on? I'm like, I work on it all. They're like, everything? I'm like, everything. That could be a lot. So then we then said, marketing analytics, let's make sure that what we're putting out in the market is actually working. How does that respond in the short term? Ratings, viewership, digital consumption, social followers, but also long term. Like, what, how does, what is the impact is this doing to our brand? Are we growing? fans and viewers, and among youth and expansion audiences. Um, so that really transformed into writing what we'll talk about later, which is our media principles playbook, as well as a long-term planning strategy. Oftentimes, this was uh, an interesting observation on the agency side, where I was like, Isa, the Olympics happens every two years. Why does it catch us by surprise every single time? Same thing applied on the ESPN side, where it's like, how do we get ahead so that we could do bigger, better things in the moment? So long-range planning was the second one. Analytics was one that I mentioned. And then also managing our contractual commitments with our lead partners, 
we wouldn't be ESPN without all of our lead partners. So that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. And then also how do we set up to make sure that we're partnering for longevity. A lot of these relationships are five, ten years in the making. And how do we make sure that we're bringing our A game every single year? Amazing. And uh, took the words right out of my mouth with a great segue into planning. Um, I feel like everyone in this room obviously has a pretty extensive day-to-day -day working with their own in-house brand teams, whether it's their agency team, but you and your team have uh, an exponential volume on top of that when you're dealing with the contractual lead partners. And a lot of the properties for everyone else that might be wondering are the kind of major sports that they're working with, whether it be the NBA, NHL, NFL, um, and we'll get into later some of the really growing sports that are climbing up to that kind of top tier five. But how are you guys working best with not only the brand team, I'd say a lead partner like the NBA, but not only that, but also the agency? And then how are, is your agency, Publicis, who's also represented today, um, working with perhaps their agency to make sure that plans are indeed duped or they're working best together? So there is there was a soundbite that um, now lives in a Read free in my mind from a senior leader and who has become a really great mentor. And what he said is that there's no off season when planning for live sport. And when working with our unique brand teams, they we have an NBA season and then we have um, the the New York Marathon that happens. Everything is long, short, and important to someone always. So there's really there, the secret is that there really was no special sauce to prioritization because something is important to everyone and how do you honor that and make every partner feel like yes you can trust me with your baby and I will respect it I will honor it and I will celebrate it for everything that makes it great and for us this the the key to that was being able to set up strategic conversations anywhere between a year to 18 months in advance and say what is your vision and goal what is important to you what is the top thing that you want to walk away with and say, hey, in the post buy, we did this. We obliterated this benchmark. We fulfilled this goal, and we were able to bring this to life. So knowing would it be cyclical and the seasons are at the same time every year, are there any good examples where maybe we learned something a year or two seasons ago for one of the properties where, and I mean, you're working with the same people year after year or two, where everybody was like, all right, Maybe we'll put it on the shelf for next season and it actually came up as a learning experience. That's a great question. So one of the things is also having a very disciplined approach. And I think there is definitely an element of a listening tour, giving everyone an opportunity and a platform to say what they need to say and get it off their chest so that you're, you're truly hearing them. And then it's a lot of active listening and saying, OK, you said in this meeting that this was really important to you, but now we're bringing this up. How does this fit within our goals? How do we think about how this drives impact in the long term, knowing that it's going to take a lot more effort? And a great example is we have this long-standing league partner, and um, they have we have a lot of value that we need to drive for them, but yet their planning time lift are always falling short of where we need it to be. And we're like, hey, and one of the, the great sound bites that I got from our last panel is that when you partner with ESPN, you are partnering with us for our sports expertise, not only within your property and platform, but also across all of live sports. And I think that was a really important element in planning for years to come, is that fans are not just a singular fan of one sport. They are multi-dimensional, they are multifaceted. I might be a really hardcore college football fan, but I might dabble in tennis because I live in New York and the US Open is a cultural moment for our city. Um, and how do we appeal to both sides of that, especially in September when you have the women's championship and college football kicking off at the same time? So really we're saying, hey team, this is how you best show up on ESPN relative to everything else that is going on in the world in the moment. So it's like, yes, we're talking about college football, but yes, we're also talking about the US Open. How do we interplay between the both and make sure that we're growing one plus one plus three? Yeah, and I feel it's so relevant, too, to kind of work creative in a little bit, I have to, um, is when everyone's on so many devices at once, and it's something that came up in a recent meeting for when the campaigns were launching, is co-viewing audiences. And I feel like on one hand, you have the co-viewing audience, and on the other side, you have multiple devices going on at once, and, and creative on 
all of them, and sometimes tied, and sometimes not. How are you getting them to work together and really continuing the conversation? I know, especially now, this time of year, with holidays, you're going to have everyone just wanting to be together on the couch at the same time. Maybe only 25% of the family enjoys sports. What's the kind of approach to a co-viewing audience to build up the brand, but then also play on the fact that entertainment is probably playing the name versus sport? That, for us, is acknowledging, and this is something that we share with our league partners as well, who is very focused on the big screen. And there, it's funny because when you were thinking about, when you said co-viewing instantly, it was like, how do we think about like mobile viewing as well? And I feel like that is something that is now table stakes, right? It's not just like mobile viewing, big screen, it's like just viewing. It's consumption as a whole. And some of the work that we did internally, segmentation-wise, was really going beyond um, demographics. My, my biggest pain point is like, oh, when I say, who do you want to market to? And everyone's like, adults 25 to 54. I'm like, yes, and every other agency in, in the city, right? And with our ESPN segmentation, we were able to get away from just demographics and gender and age and instead say, well, how does this person, how are they most receptive to information? Some people, it's X's and O's. You could say athlete, athlete, this, that, this, that. Or you could say, hey, here are, this is what this person likes to do in their free time. Or like, Lewis Hamilton's dog has a full on Instagram that is dedicated only to his own. Or this person prefers this brand of, I don't know, stuffing over this brand. And like, these are these little things where it's like, oh, I see myself in that person too. Like, I now identify and I am now interested in other things or other opinions that I have. Say. So in terms of the co-viewing experience, it's being able to pepper in all of those different kind of nuggets, and then that way there's a little something for everyone, but also acknowledging that we also know more about our fans than we have in, in years past, and I love the growth, the, the enormous growth that we've had in our CRM space specifically. If you are not subscribed, I um, highly recommend subscribing to What to Experience, and that cuts through for you in our fans' inbox saying, these are the biggest events that you need to care about this week or this weekend. And you might be coming in for this NFL game. Um, we just had the, um, the Eagles rematch. I call it the Taylor Swift game, the Eagles rematch with Kansas City. But you also might be interested in this game or this piece of content. And it's, it encourages sampling. And it's like, oh, yeah, I might have heard about that. Like, I was going to come in for this, but I'm going to consider that. The Eagles can come, yeah. Was, the other one was good, too, the other day. Um, great answer, thank you so much. Um, and then kind of, as we're, as we're progressing along with planning, um, I feel like everyone in this room too is trying to get the most out of their media. And it comes down, especially with ESPN and a legacy brand like Disney, a lot of folks immediately think, all right, you guys are not only uh, as the organization selling media, but also purchasing and running media. With planning, how are you finding to get the experience across? What is, are the consumers, the fan experience, how do we find a way to get them to get the most out of what they're doing, but still kind of stay on track for those long-term 18-month planning goals that you were talking about? Right, so after we have our strategic planning kickoff saying, this is what our long-term goals are, these are the short-term goals are, the next step is usually within kind of our audience assessment, if you will. Um, not very good, still working on the marketing phrase for that. Because everyone needs a catch-all, a catch right? Um, totally. Our, our approach is to understand where is that fan base in the universe. So not only how much of that audience is captured within ESPN-owned media, and we, um, or rather my team and I, have the privilege of managing over about half a billion dollars worth of media inventory. And not all publishers have that have that privilege. So we are so lucky to be able to do that. And that's cross-platform between linear and digital, our app, podcast, CRM, all of the above. How many of those audiences are we re reaching naturally on channel? Who are then we also are reaching within the Walt Disney Company? So how do we think about ABC's reach, Hulu, Disney Plus, et cetera? And then what is the most addressable, most convertible audience that we can get in paid. I think my dream state for any partners out there listening is to then add their audiences on top of that. And it's like, well, how are we reaching? Like, what does the audience look like within your own media or that your agency is planning? And just continuing to grow those numbers of Venn diagrams to then say, okay, what's the target look like? Here's the most convertible, here's our sweet spot, and then who do we need to kind of 
bring into the fold, maybe a little bit gent more gently, give them more brand content, more peaks of interest, and that's someone that we'll keep our eye out in the next five years and then continue to grow with them. Great answer. Um, and then from moving along from there, I feel like we have to, uh, we have to talk about ESPN Plus. Always. Always. Um, has, I would, I would love to get your perspective too on where it sits today. I feel like it's so interesting because when it comes to tune in and streaming, there's so many, we went obviously from linear TV running everything to now kind of everybody just creating their own lane digitally and the streaming services all to kind of appear, appearing to do the same thing but in different ways. How are you guys kind of approaching the branding perspective of it, but at the same time just trying to get people to find the sports they love? And uh, I have a third question as well, but I'm going to let you answer that. Thank you. Thank you for chunking it out for me. So with ESPN Plus, what I love about our approach to streaming so far as of today is that it is not a duplicative experience to what is on linear. It is complementary. So yes, we have our core offering that is available on cable, but if you are a diehard anything and you are the underserved fan who can just not find your sport, chances are ESPN Plus is going to have it. And on my train ride over here, I, I commute from DC. Um, I, I met a gentleman who was like, you know, I'm a huge college basketball fan. And for years, it pained me where I could not watch my team. And it was because he was out of market. And at that point, it's like, oh, you might get creative. Like, I remember Sling used to have this box where you have to set up, and it just became very clunky. And it was just hard. And I still applaud all soccer fans who are just committed to signing up for every subscription there is to get the games that they want. So my, my heart goes out to you. Um, but ESPN Plus is able to represent and serve sports fans in that way. So it, it gives them access. It gives them a moment of reprieve and a, an ability to kind of escape the day-to-day -day and, and celebrate. So oftentimes, you'll either get additional content, and then sometimes you also get dual content. So it's, it's a little fusion of both, and it's interesting to see how that's going to set up for our next phase of DTC. And the third follow-up question, from you and your team being in the data and kind of seeing all the results, and now over year three of ESPN Plus, I think? How, how long has uh, it been in market? How long has ESPN Plus been in market? I want to say like five. Five years? Oh, it's fast. I want to say five. So looking back on the last four or five years, has there been any properties or sports that have really surprised you guys how how much they've built up, where it's gotten you kind of reconsider maybe moving it to the brand messaging, or maybe uh, throwing it out a little wider, seeing how many people have tuned in to watch that remote soccer game in the country no one's ever heard of? I mean, we've heard of all the countries, but I would say my the biggest thing in terms of working with league partners specifically is seeing how excited they are about ESPN Plus. I, I feel like when ESPN Plus first launched, and I mean, that's with any innovation, right? Like how many times have we been sitting in a meeting where everyone's like, I want to be first, I want to be first, I want to try the alpha or the beta or whatever, and it's like, well, do you have proven results? And we're like, come on, we can't have, we can't have your cake and eat it too. So having league partners actually ask and say like, well, what do I need to be included on ESPN Plus and how is this audience different? Goes to show that there is a lot of confidence in it and more and more programming is being either exclusively screened on there or being shared simulcast. I got that Cyber Monday deal for ESPN Plus, so I'm excited to view them all. Well, thank you. Thank you for being such a Yeah, ESPN Plus too. Um, so, Time. We, I have one more question for you and then we'll open it up to the group to see if anybody has any questions. But um, in kind of closing it, bringing it back to digital innovation, is there anything, whether it be from a product tech standpoint or just from a strategy planning standpoint, that you guys are looking forward to trying for the first time in 2024 or um, perhaps uh, after that? For us, I would say it's maybe not a launch, but it's more of an iteration of. Um, the alternative cast has become very, very popular with our league partners as well as our fans, and I feel like that's probably the best way to meet fans where they are. And um, is everyone familiar with the alternative casts? That's where the ESPN folks will get uh, Manning Brothers for Monday Night Football, or Pat McAfee's doing for college football, and will run simultaneously on ESPN2. 
So it's like a choose-your-own-adventure, if you will. So you could have the standard game, which is on ESPN or on ABC, um, or you could have uh, a youth-focused one, which we partnered with the NHL to do for Big City Greens. We did that last March. It's going to come and get, come back again this next year. Uh, we also just did one that was Toy Storyified for the NFL, which we were super excited about. And both were very effective in reaching youth audiences and really making sure that it's it's not just X's and O's, but using IP that is familiar to that audience, getting them really excited about how the presentation is being brought forward, but also giving them a new kind of narrative. It's not just about this player or this coach, but it's like, well, how is, um, how is Slinky Dog being incorporated? And how does that set up in terms of just like the game mnemonic? So those are the things that just continue to iterate on those and, and reaching new expansion audiences. Amazing. Thank you so much. This was so much thank fun. You. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so, so much for sharing tonight. Thank you so much.